Um, there are other things like a good piece of music which you want to hear over and over and it doesn't matter how many times you've heard it. It just is always good to hear. I assume my lectures are like that. <laughs> Leonard Susskind, who is well known for his brilliant lectures on physics, has done a lot of major work in theoretical physics. And in this video, these are his major contributions that we will talk about. I am a theoretical physicist myself and I will try to simplify stuff as much as I can. But before talking about Leonard Susskind's work, let's talk about his background. So let's start the video. Leonard Susskind was born on June 16, 1940 in South Bronx, which is in New York City. He did not come from an academic background because his father was a plumber. When he was 16, his father got sick and at this very early age, he had to go for plumbing jobs. He later recalled that being plumber was not a fun job. Susskind went to City College of New York in 1957, but he got there as an engineering student. There he met Professor Harry Sudak. Sudak was one of the physicists who worked on Manhattan Project, and due to his interaction with Professor Sudak, he got interested in theoretical physics, and later he decided to become a physicist. He recalled his discussion with his father when he told him that he wants to become a physicist. When I told my father I wanted to be a physicist, he said, hell no, you ain't going to work in a drugstore. I said, no, not a pharmacist, I said, like Einstein. He poked me in the chest with a piece of plumbing pipe. You ain't going to be no engineer, he said, you are going to be Einstein. He switched his major to physics and in 1962, he graduated with a bachelor's in physics. After his bachelor's, he went to Cornell University and started his PhD in physics. His advisor was Peter Caruthers. Caruthers later served as the leader of the theoretical division of the Los Alamos Laboratory from 1973 to 1980. Susskind got his PhD from the Cornell University in 1965. After his PhD, he joined Yeshiva University in 1966 as an assistant professor. Later, he was promoted to an associate professor and he remained at Yeshiva University until 1970. In 1970, he left Yeshiva University for Tel Aviv University, which is the biggest university in Israel. He left Tel Aviv University in 1972, and in 1972, he rejoined Yeshiva University. But this time, he remained there for almost eight years before leaving the Yeshiva University in 1979. His affiliation with Stanford University started in 1979, and to this day, he is at Stanford University. In the year 2000, he got the Felix Bloch Professorship at Stanford University, and he holds this professorship to this day. He also also holds a distinguished membership at Perimeter Institute and in 2007 he got a distinguished professorship at Korean Institute of Advanced Study which is also known as KIAS. In 1960s, physicists were trying to understand the scattering of particles called hadrons. Hadrons are particles that are made up of quarks and antiquarks, for example, protons and neutrons. An example of the particles that physicists were trying to understand is pions. It was discovered that this process has a symmetry called crossing symmetry. It means that if you change the Feynman diagram of the process in a particular way, the resulting process has the same probability as the original one. I'm using the word probability here to make things simple, but the technical jargon for what I refer to as probability here is scattering amplitude or just amplitude. These two diagrams are called S-channel diagram and the T-channel diagram. It was also discovered that if you observe this process at a very high energy, the amplitude of this process is proportional to the power of the energy of the process. This is very oversimplified, but this is the gist of it. This behavior is called the Regi behavior. People didn't know how to write down the expressions for the amplitude that has the Regi behavior and crossing symmetry. In 1968, Gabriel Veneziano wrote a paper in which he wrote down his famous formula for the desired amplitude. This amplitude is now called the Veneziano amplitude. When Leonard Susskind saw this formula, he tried to give an analogy for this formula in terms of, you guessed it, the harmonic oscillator. But the problem with this analogy was that this particular analogy did not have crossing symmetry. In a later paper, he generalized this model and in this generalization, he was able to get the crossing symmetry as well. This generalized model could be seen as a vibrating string and therefore he suggested that we can see the hadrons as vibrating strings. This model was eventually replaced by the more successful theory of hadrons, which is quantum chromodynamics, but these papers by Veneziano and Susskind are often referred to as the birth of string theory. Leonard Susskind is also called the father of string theory for the same reason. Susskind has also done some significant work in an area called lattice gauge theory. When we study a field theory, we study it on a continuous space-time, but we can also study it on discrete set of points instead of a continuous space-time. This discrete set of points is called a lattice. Now we can study a quantum field theory on this lattice. 
and the most studied quantum field theories on lattices are gauge theories. This is the reason why this area is called lattice gauge theory. In 1974, physicist Kenneth Wilson was trying to solve a problem called quark confinement. This problem asks you to explain why you can't observe a single quark. Wilson could not solve the problem, but to solve this problem, he introduced a variation of lattice gauge theory. In this variation, you discretize space, but you keep time as it is. This variation is called Hamiltonian lattice gauge theory, and this is the area in which Susskind worked with physicist John Cogut. In this work, Wilson's lattice could be seen as a collection of quarks joined by strings, but these strings are not the strings of string theory. They tried to explain quark confinement by pointing out that you cannot break a string without creating a pair and therefore you can never see an individual quark. They also solved some problems that arise when you try to put fermions on a lattice. I would not go into the details of their work, but their work introduced a special type of fermions called kuget susskind fermions. The advantage of these fermions is that they are much easier to study through simulations on a computer. Susskind also worked on an area called baryogenesis. We know that in our universe, we have much more matter than antimatter. However, if you see our fundamental theories of physics, they treat matter and antimatter in a similar way. In fact, our theories are perfectly symmetric under a combination of three transforms. Transformations. These transformations are called C, P, and T. C transformation changes matter with antimatter, P transformation replaces the universe with its mirror image, and T transformation reverses the arrow of time. These transformations, when applied together, make the CPT transformation, and there is a theorem called CPT theorem which says that our universe is perfectly symmetric under the CPT transformation. Now one can ask that why our universe has more matter than antimatter. In 1967, a Russian physicist Andrei Sakharov was working on this problem and he came up with three conditions that should be met to produce this matter-antimatter asymmetry. These conditions are called Sakharov conditions and they say that any process that is responsible for generating matter and antimatter at a different rate should not conserve a number called the baryon number. Every quark has a baryon number of 1 over 3 and every anti-quark has a baryon number minus 1 over 3. In the standard model, the baryon number is conserved. So it means that we need something beyond the standard model. In addition, such a process should not have symmetry under C and CP transformations. And lastly, such a process should not happen at thermal equilibrium. However, this was the time of Cold War and the communication between Soviet physics and the physics in the Western Hemisphere was not very smooth. Therefore, Sakharov's work was largely unnoticed in the Western Hemisphere. With the physicist Savas Demopoulos, Suskin worked on the same problem and in 1974, they reached a similar conclusion and Sakharov did in 1967, but since Sakharov's work was unnoticed, his work was not even cited in this paper. Sakharov's work was discovered in the Western Hemisphere later and he was given his due credit that he deserved for his work. Suskin has also done a lot of work on black hole information paradox. An example of his work is his work on a principle called the black hole complementarity principle. It is well known due to the work of a lot of physicists that black holes can only have three properties that can be measured from outside and these properties are its mass, its electrical charge, and its angular momentum. This raises the question that where does the information about the matter that collapsed to make the black hole go? In 1975, Stephen Hawking showed that it is possible for black holes to emit radiation. It can completely evaporate by emitting this radiation. This opens more questions about the information that this radiation carries. This apparent loss of information is called the black hole information paradox. Susskind and Hawking had a bet on the resolution of this paradox. Hawking thought that the information is genuinely lost in the black hole and we need to change quantum mechanics to describe this loss. Suskin, on the other hand, thought that the information is not lost in this scenario. To read about the details of this conflict, you can read Suskin's book titled The Black Hole War. In 1993, Suskin wrote a paper where he proposed that when a string falls into a black hole, an observer who is falling with the string and an observer who is seeing all this from very far away will see completely different things. The falling observer will see the string as a very small thing, almost like the point particle, and all the information of the string will be contained within the string. The faraway observer will see that the information of the string will be smeared on the surface of the black hole, and for this observer, a string will not remain a localized point particle. This difference between what two observers observe is called the black hole complementarity principle. There is another work of Susskind that relates to this work of black hole complementarity principle. In the late 1970s, physicists Roscoe Giles Larry McLaren and Charles Thorne in several papers 
observed that string theory can have a lower dimensional description and the full theory can be recovered from this lower dimensional theory. As an example, this lower dimensional theory can live on the boundary of the space in which the full theory lives. For example, if the theory is defined on a disk, the lower dimensional theory can live on the boundary circle. Much later in 1993, physicist Gerard Tuft was studying the Hawking radiation emitted by black holes and he came to the conclusion that for quantum mechanics and general relativity to coexist, our three-dimensional space should be a holographic image of a two-dimensional boundary of this three-dimensional space. This proposal of Tuft was made more precise by Susskind in 1995 in his most cited paper titled The World as a Hologram. In this paper, Susskind considered string theory as a realization of Tuft's idea and put the holographic principle on a firmer footing. This principle was further developed by people like Juan Maldacena for his very famous work on ADS-CFD correspondence and today, holographic principle is a very very active area of research. In 1995, physicist Edward Britton proposed that all string theories can be considered as limits of a single underlying theory called M-theory. In 1996, working with Stephen Shanker, Willy Fischler and Tom Banks, Susskind came up with another description of M-theory where you have a very large number of point particle objects called D0 brains. Using these D0 brains, they were able to recover a lot of features of M-theory. This model is named after these four people and it is called the BFSS model. M-theory lives in 11 dimensions and the BFSS model was a description of M theory where all of these dimensions are large dimensions. When you compactify some of these dimensions, you need to make some changes to the BFSS model. In 1997, physicist Ashok Sen took this problem and showed that if some dimensions of M theory are curled up into a torus, then the D0 brains in the BFSS model also move on such a torus. However, in Ashok Sen's work, the number of dimensions of the torus could not be more than 5. One of Susskind's proposals did put him in a heated debate against the physicist Lee Smolin. We know that string theory is a unique theory, but it comes up with a huge number of possibilities for how the extra dimensions of string theory are curled up. The set of this huge number of possibilities is called the string landscape. In 2003, Susskind wrote an article titled The Anthropic Landscape of String Theory, in which he argued that the string landscape gives credence to the anthropic principle. Anthropic principle is a way to explain the features of the world in which we live by saying that if this particular feature of the world was not there, then it would not support life and therefore we would not be here to ask this question or explore this feature. This kind of explanation explanation is very controversial and a large number of physicists consider this kind of explanation to be unscientific. Other physicists think that for some features of the world, this is the only kind of explanation that you can have. As an example, in 1987, physicist Steven Weinberg was able to use the anthropic argument to provide a range in which the value of the cosmological constant should lie and in late 90s, the measured value of the cosmological constant was found in this very range. However, the precise question that Weinberg asked was that what should be the range of the cosmological constant if we allow Allow the galaxies to form. And since galaxies are required for life to exist, Weinberg termed this reasoning as anthropic. However, some physicists don't agree that this reasoning is anthropic. In 2004, physicist Lee Smolin wrote an article called Scientific Alternatives to the Anthropic Principle, where he also criticized the approach taken by Susskind. Smolin then sent an email to Susskind for his comments on the paper, but since Susskind hadn't read the paper, he asked Smolin to summarize his paper in an email. Smolin summarized this paper in an email which can be found on the website edge.org. The link to this website is in the description. Susskind didn't agree with Smollett's reasoning. Finally, they were invited by the website edge.org to write final letters in this debate. But they would be only allowed one letter to which they would not be allowed to make changes and they cannot see each other's letters in advance. These are really long letters and going over the content of these letters will take a whole separate video. If you want to read them, these letters are available and you can find them at the link in the description. A recent idea that was proposed by Susskind and Maldacena was the idea of EPR equals ER. In 1935, Albert Einstein wrote two papers. One of them was written with Nathan Rosen and this paper was about tunnels in space-time called wormholes. This paper is also called the Einstein-Rosen paper or just the ER paper. The other paper was about the possibility of quantum entanglement and it was written in collaboration with Nathan Rosen and Boris Potolsky. Hence, this is also called the EPR paper. The EPR equals ER idea establishes a link between quantum entanglement and wormholes. After Susskind's paper on black hole complementarity, people found some problems with this proposal. If a particle-antiparticle pair is produced near a black hole, one of these particles can go into the black hole, let's call it D, and the other one can fly off to a large distance. Let's call this particle A. This is how Hawking radiation is produced. Now, A and D need to remain entangled. It turns out that if 
if they don't remain entangled, it is in conflict with the prediction of general relativity. In general relativity, an observer falling into the black hole doesn't feel anything strange because the horizon of the black hole is smooth without any singularities. It turns out that if A and D don't remain entangled, the horizon of the black hole does not remain smooth. The real problem starts when the black hole becomes quite old. Let's assume that there is a second particle antiparticle pair and one of them goes into the black hole, let's call it C, and the other one starts to go far away, let's call it B. Now B is the new Hawking radiation and A is the old Hawking radiation. Due to the work of Don Page, there are some arguments that when a black hole becomes old enough, the old Hawking radiation becomes entangled with the new Hawking radiation. This means that the particle B is entangled with particle A and particle C, although A and C are independent of each other. This is something that cannot happen. We know that a system cannot be entangled to two other systems that are independent of each other. This principle is called the monogamy of entanglement and this is a big problem for black hole physics. In 2012, physicists Emma Delamiri, Donald Marolf, Joseph Polchinski and James Sully provided a resolution of this problem by saying that particles B and C are not entangled. They said that entanglement between two particles goes away when one of them falls into the black hole. Recall that this entanglement was necessary for the horizon to stay smooth. But the entanglement between B and C can't just vanish in thin air. It turns out that this loss of entanglement causes large amounts of energy to be deposited just inside the event horizon of the black hole. And this creates what physicists call a firewall. Any observer falling into the black hole will be burned because of this firewall wall and therefore the horizon of the black hole will not stay smooth. In order to counter the firewall proposal and to solve the original problem, Susskind and Juan Maldacena gave the EPR equals ER proposal. This proposal says that any two entangled particles are joined by a wormhole. These wormholes can be very small in size but they are there. Due to this proposal, we can see that in the original problem, a and C are joined by a wormhole and therefore they are not independent and the firewall problem goes away. This proposal has some problems though. An entangled state is a linear combination of states that are not entangled. So the state in which two particles are joined by a wormhole should be a linear combination of the states in which particles are not joined by a wormhole. This seems a very very strange conclusion and people are working on this problem. A very recent contribution of Susskind that I will just mention briefly is his work on complexity. Look at this diagram which is called the Penrose diagram of a black hole. In this diagram, time increases roughly in the upward direction. You can see that this region increases in size with time. This region represents the black hole. Now, how do you interpret the increase in this region? Is it the increase in entropy? Well, it cannot be that because entropy takes a very short time to stabilize to its maximum value. So it should be something else. Working on this problem with some of his collaborators, Suskin proposed that this increase actually demonstrates the increase in complexity of the black hole. To understand complexity, take this example. I have taken this example from Sean Carroll's book, The Big Picture. And by the way, if you have not read that book already, I will definitely recommend it to you. Take a cup of coffee and put some cream on top of it. At the beginning, this system is so simple to describe. It is just coffee and cream and they are not mixed together. We say that its complexity is small. As this cream starts to mix with coffee, the system becomes more and more difficult to describe. Its complexity starts to rise. After a long time, when the coffee and cream have mixed together completely, the system is again very easy to describe. It is a homogeneous mixture of coffee and cream. Its complexity has gone down again. So we see that complexity does not always increase like entropy, but it is a well-defined concept to talk about. Susskind used a particular kind of complexity called computational complexity, which is is relevant for computational circuits. He proposed that the increase in the size of the region is not just due to the increase in entropy, but complexity. In 2019, computer scientists Adam Boland, Bill Pfefferman, and Umesh Wazirani found some evidence for Susskind's proposal. Working with his collaborator Adam Brown, Susskind also tried to formulate a second law of complexity, just like the second law of thermodynamics. In short, this second law of complexity says that if the computational complexity is less than maximum, then with overwhelming likelihood it will increase both into the future and into the past. This connection between complexity and black holes is an active area of research right now. Susskind is also very well known for his books including The Cosmic Landscape, The Black Hole Wars and The Theoretical Minimum. But more than his books, he is very well known for his brilliant physics lectures. His lectures are not meant to be technical and the main idea of his lectures is to explain the ideas in a clear way without delving deep into the calculations. These lectures are a good stepping stone for physics students to start learning different areas of physics. 
Physics. When I was an undergrad, I saw his lectures on general relativity before reading more advanced books on general relativity. His lectures are truly a work of art. In the end, I would say that Leonard Susskind is a very inspirational figure, both for teachers and for students. He is also an example of the lesson that you neither need to have an academic family background nor need to be a mathematical wizard to make grand contributions to theoretical physics. Deep insight into the inner workings of the universe will take you a long way and when it comes to having deep physical insight, Susskind is just a master of it. That's it from my side and if you liked the video then please consider subscribing and I will see you in the next video.